Hello and welcome to another episode of Rugby 9-4. Today will be the first part of a three-part series about World Cup squads and how they are decided upon. The first part will be focusing on how coaches structure their World Cup squads. The second and third episodes will focus on who will be in the England World Cup squad. So let's get into the first part of the series. How will coaches structure their squads? Well, to understand how your team's coach is going to build their squad, we should first look at the World Rugby rules around World Cup squads to give us our foundations. Each team is limited to 31 players in a squad. A player can only be replaced for medical or compassionate reasons. Teams must complete the relevant paperwork and send it into World Rugby along with a medical certificate where appropriate. Once signed off, the replacement is not allowed to play for 48 hours and the replacement is permanent. So with that, we know our squad is limited to 31 players and that because of the 48 hour replacement period, it would be a risk not to take three players capable of playing in highly specialised positions like hooker. This in turn highlights the importance of utility players. It goes without saying a player capable of covering two to three positions will be highly valuable, even if they aren't top class in one specific position. The next thing to take into account is the split between forwards and backs. There are two options that teams will almost always go for, 17 forwards and 14 backs, or 18 forwards and 13 backs. As we can see, all World Cup squads are generally forwards heavy because of two major factors. Firstly, you have more forwards on the pitch at any one time. Secondly, the attrition rate amongst forwards can be higher. For instance, in the last World Cup, 11 backs suffered tournament ending injuries, whereas 16 forwards were ruled out for injury. Now if we take a look at the last World Cup in 2015, of the 20 teams, 13 went with 17-14 and 7 went with 18-13. However, if we take a look at the forwards back splits by team tier, we can see that of the 10 tier 1 teams, 80% went with 17-14 and only 20% 18-13. In contrast of the tier 2 teams, it was a 50-50 split between 17-14 and 18-13. The only reason I can think of as to why there is such a difference is that Tier 2 teams feel that their back row players are going to be more fatigued playing against Tier 1 teams and thus want to be able to rotate more often. Now let's break it down into the structure of individual positions. On average, the majority of teams will bring 3 hookers and 5 props, with there normally being 2 loose heads and 2 tight heads plus 1 more who can play either side. Into the back 5, there would normally be 4 locks and depending on which split is chosen, there will normally be 3-4 to four flankers and 1-2 to two number 8s. As for the backs, the average is 3 scrum halves, 2 fly halves, 4 centres, 3 wingers, and depending on split, 1 or 2 full backs. The back split has much more potential for variety due to positions being less specialised and more utility players. For instance, many wingers can cover full back and vice versa. With that said, the numbers that I have gone through in the positional breakdown should be taken with a pinch of salt, as they are averages with a lot of variety. For instance, at the 2015 World Cup, Namibia only included two specialist locks, and Uruguay stacked their back row options with six flankers. With all of that information, you can now start to make an educated guess at how your nation's coaching team will be building their squad, and why certain players may be valued more than others. Well guys, that was just a small primer for the second and third parts of this series, and I hope you found it interesting. If you did, give the video a like and hit that subscribe button, and I'll see you in the next one.